Super Paper Mario, released in 2007, is the third entry in the Paper Mario series of role-playing games. Unlike the previous two titles, which featured turn-based combat, Super Paper Mario features more action platformer-oriented gameplay and a 2D game world that can be flipped into 3D, revealing secrets and hidden passages not normally visible to the player. In the middle of the game, the player will come across a mysterious room with eight switches and a locked door. When the player activates one of the switches, they will find that a subset of the eight lights will begin to glow. Each switch in the room toggles a unique subset of the eight lights, and the only way to unlock the door is to turn on all the lights. These light switch puzzles have appeared in many video games, and can sometimes lead a frustrated player to try and obtain the solution by brute force trial and error. Let's take a look at a general method for solving these types of puzzles. I should start off by saying that this method might seem a little complicated if you've never seen it before, but it is also very powerful because it can be used to solve any light switch puzzle, regardless of the specific switch toggle patterns. We'll start with a simpler example problem with four lights and four switches. We'll call the switches A, B, C, and D, and we'll call the lights L1, L2, L3, and L4. The first step is to activate and deactivate each switch so we know which lights they toggle. Activating switch A toggles only light 1. For this situation, I will be listing all of the toggling information in the following table. A 1 means that the switch toggles that light, while a 0 means that the switch does not affect the light. Activating switch B toggles lights 1, 2, and 3. Activating switch C toggles lights 3 and 4. And activating switch D toggles lights 1 and 4. Our goal is to determine whether or not each of the switches should be activated. In other words, we wish to assign a value of on or off to each of the four switches A, B, C, and D. How can we do this? Well, the trick is to realize that the final state of the lights is equal to some combination of all of the toggling patterns available to us. For example, let's say we choose to turn on switches A and D. We leave switches B and C alone. To get our final state, we simply add the toggling patterns for switches A and D together. When the sum is 2, we simply mean that the light is toggled twice. It's equivalent to 0, or off. In the final state, we only have one light activated. Of course, this is not what we want, but hopefully it gives you some intuition as to how the toggling patterns add together to give the final result. You might say that the final result is a superposition of the toggling patterns. So knowing this, how do we get the solution? We can write out the final state of each light as a superposition of all the switches that control it. For example, Light L1 is a superposition of the switches A, B, and D, so we write A plus B plus D equals L1. I've left a zero in there just to make sure that it's clear that switch C does not affect light 1. We can do this for all the other lights like I've done below. For each light we get one equation. At this point we can substitute a 1 for each of L1, L2, L3, and L4, since we want the final result to be that all the lights are turned on. Now, A, B, C, and D are the only unknowns. Using equation 2, we can immediately see that B equals 1. We can now substitute B equals 1 into the other equations. In equation 3, we can see that C equals 0. Again, we substitute C equals 0 into the other equations. Using equation 4, we can see that D equals 1. We substitute D equals 1 into the final equation. We now get that A equals minus 1. We can consider negative 1 as an odd number, so it is equivalent to 1 toggle, or on. So we have switches A, B, and D are on, while switch C is off. But does this really work? We can confirm the results by summing the toggle patterns of A, B, and D. Again, a 3 simply means we toggle the switch 3 times. It is equivalent to turning it on. In general, even numbers signify off, while odd numbers signify on. So it turns out that our method of variable solving works. In this example, the variables were very easy to solve for. In other cases, things might not be so easy. Let's take a look at a harder example with seven switches and seven lights. I'll call the switches A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and I'll label the lights L1 through L7. Below is a table summarizing the toggle patterns for each switch. Here you might notice that the third and sixth rows give us immediately the solutions to variables C and F. The other solutions are not very clear, however, so we need to be a little creative in trying to solve for them. We can write this system of seven equations a little more compactly using the following notation. The columns of numbers are called vectors, 
and the box of numbers is called a matrix. Notice that the matrix is just a collection of seven column vectors. Each switch variable A, B, C, D, E, F, G has a corresponding column showing which lights it toggles. The first column is switch A, the second column is switch B, and so on. Each column represents one of the seven toggling patterns we saw earlier. Each row represents one of the seven equations that must be solved. Here's an interesting fact. When a matrix that represents a system of equations has all zeros in the bottom left triangle, solutions are really easy to get. We can read the solution off the bottom row and work our way up, substituting as we go. We say a matrix like this is in row echelon form. But our matrix is not in row echelon form, so how can we change that? Now comes the interesting part. You might remember from high school algebra that as long as you modify two sides of an equation in the same way, the equation is still valid. That means that we can scale valid equations by constants. We can also add or subtract equations from each other and still retain valid equations. We're also free to swap the rows of a matrix, as long as we're sure to swap the entries in the vector that represent the right-hand side of the equation along with the rows. We do not need to swap the variables since they are associated with the matrix columns, which do not move. Using these three actions, scaling, adding and subtracting, and swapping, we can get this matrix into row echelon form. As it turns out, the easiest way to get this matrix into row echelon form is to simply get ones along the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. First, we recognize that the third and sixth rows only have a single non-zero entry in them. This means that they don't need any further modification. Rows like this are useful because we can use them to modify single entries in the matrix through addition and subtraction. For example, using the third row, we can change the two ones I've highlighted here to zeros. First, we'll take the second row and subtract the third row. Next, we'll take the fourth row and subtract the third row. We can also use the sixth row to remove some of the ones. We can subtract row six from row one, and we can subtract row six from row five. The next thing to notice is that row one and row four look very similar. We can try subtracting row four from row one. At this point, row one only has a single non-zero entry, so we're done with it as well. Again, we can use this row to easily remove ones and other rows through subtraction. And whenever we see two similar looking rows, we can try subtracting them as well. Eventually, each row will only have a single non-zero entry. Now it's just a matter of swapping the rows until we have ones along the diagonal. We can swap row 1 with row 7, and finally row 2 with row 7. This matrix is now in row echelon form. We can read the solutions directly from the right-hand column. We see that A, C, E, F, and G are all odd numbers, so they represent on switches. B and D are even, so they represent off switches. Adding all the toggle patterns together, we see that the results are all odd numbers, which means all of the lights have been turned on. So again, our method works. This whole process is confusing the first time you see it, and it takes a bit of practice before you realize which row operations to use when. For some practice, why not try putting the four equation system from our first example into row echelon form? you might find harder problems easier after doing that. Now if you come across this puzzle in another video game, you might encounter a situation that's a little different from the ones we've mentioned so far. For example, what if some of the lights are already on when the player walks into the room? Or what if the player decides that they want another combination of lights other than the lights being all on at once? Well we can use the same method. All we need to do is subtract the initial state of the lights from the desired state of the lights. The resulting vector is the change we wish to apply to the system. Also be aware that some puzzles may have multiple solutions. If this is the case, you will not have enough equations to solve for all of your variables. In some cases this is because one of the switch's toggling patterns can be expressed as a combination of all the other switch toggle patterns. If this is the case, try making some of the bottom rows of the matrix all zeros before continuing with this method. 
you will later have to assume that one of the switches, switch B for example, is either on or off, but it doesn't matter what you choose since there are multiple solutions anyway. Here's the puzzle from Super Paper Mario. It has eight equations and eight unknowns and presents quite a challenge. For those of you who have played the game, you would probably say getting the solution this way isn't worth all the effort, but I think it's pretty cool that you can find the answer by reason instead of relying on trial and error. If you want to give this problem a shot, the solution is in the link in the description. Remember, not everyone has played this game, so please keep your comments spoiler free. Thank you.